Well, we've made progress towards modeling systems that we would come into contact with. So we've done rotational systems, and now we're going to add systems with gears. And this is in an, in, in an effort to model motor systems, so real mechatronic systems that we come into contact with. And the reason we need to add gearing to our analysis is that rotor rotary motor applications typically have gearing, and that's because the engines produce high speed and low torque. So for example, this servo motor, we want to have a high torque here at the end so that we can turn things, and electric motors typically have a lot higher speed than we need and lower torque. So we add the uh, gearing in order to invert that relationship, so we'll get higher torque on our output but lower speed. And we're going to look now at ideal gear interactions. So this means that there's no backlash, there's no slot between the gears. Whenever gear one moves, gear two moves. And so we're going to look at how inputs are transferred to outputs. So the input gear, just defining terms here, has a radius R1 and a tooth count N1. And it's rotated a distance theta1, and that is done by applying a torque tau1. Now with the output gear, which has radius R2 and tooth count N2, we have a rotation of theta2, and this output torque is tau2. So those are all the terms that we're looking at. Now we want to relate these input and output terms. So the input displacement to the output displacement. Well, one thing we know is that the teeth here, they travel the same distance. So the teeth on gear 2 can't move any faster than the teeth on gear 1. So that means that R1 times theta1 is equal to R2 times theta2. So that's our governing equation here to get the, what's called the gear ratio. So we rearrange this and we see that the output displacement, the ratio between the output and input displacements is equal to the ratio between the input radius and output radius. And since the gears have the same pitch, that means that the number of teeth has the same proportion to the radius on both gears. So we can substitute here the number of teeth on gear 1 and number of teeth on gear 2. And now we can look at the input torque to the output torque. So we're going to assume right now that there's these are lossless gears. So they neither absorb nor dissipate energy. So they have no inertia and there's no friction. So that means that the input power is equal to the output power. So the torque times the speed is equal to the torque times the speed. And rearranging this equation, we get that output torque over input torque is equal to the number of teeth on gear 2 divided by the number of teeth on gear 1. So whenever we have gearing, <coughs> this changes the impedance seen by the motor. So if we have this moment of inertia, damping, and spring here at the output shaft of a gear, then the motor or the input shaft is going to see a different loading than here on the second shaft. So we want to find an equivalent system. So an equivalent system to this would just be uh, what does the input shaft see? You know, what, what impedance does the input shaft see? And the reason we do that is for simplification and also because we don't really, we don't have independent motions. So we have here in this figure two displacements, theta 1 and theta 2. And while they have different values, they're not independent. So theta 2 is just proportional to theta 1. And that's related by the gear ratio. So we can't move theta 1 and, and hold theta 2 fixed, and vice versa. So there's only one independent motion for this system. So here's an example of a system. And we're going to look now at finding uh, equivalent loading at the input shaft. So. Let me start by drawing the free body diagram of this mass, assuming that we have these lossless gears. So bring up the camera. So we've got mass, and it's going to move theta 2. So we're going to let it rotate theta 2. This is J. And so we're going to get some. <clears throat> resistance from the damper, so that'd be C theta 2 dot, and we'll get some resistance from the spring, so K times theta 2. And then we have an input torque, but it's not, the value is not tau. We use a relationship that we found for 
gear pairs, and so tau2 is equal to tau1 times n2 over n1. So we have tau times n2 over n1. So that's the torque that's being applied here. <coughs> so now writing the differential equation and rearranging it, we get that j times theta2 double dot plus c times theta2 dot plus k times theta2 is equal to tau times n2 over n1. All right. And now in order to get the equivalent system seen at the input shaft, we need to substitute theta1, or we need to get theta1 instead of theta2. So we use our relationship that theta1 is equal to n1 over n2 times theta2. <coughs> and that came from the definition of the gear ratio. Oops. But I really wanted this, oops, my mistake, that's not right. Theta2 is equal to n1 over n2 times theta1. There we go. So now substitute this in for theta2 and rearrange and we can get our equivalent system. So what that means, I should have drawn this earlier, but the equivalent system would look like we'd have an equivalent moment of inertia, we'll call it JE, and that has an equivalent damping CE and spring KE. And here's our input torque tau, and this motion is theta 1. Okay? So we want to relate theta 1 and tau through the mechanical impedances. And these two equations allow us to do that. So let me substitute in theta 1, or theta 2 here in this equation. And what we end up getting is <coughs> j times theta 1 double dot plus c times theta 1 dot plus k times theta 1. All that multiplied by n1 over n2 squared is equal to tau. So in our equivalent system, je is j times n1 over n2 squared. So that's this equivalent moment of inertia. Ce is c times n1 over n2 squared. And k follows the same pattern. So this concept of finding equivalent loadings through a gear ratio or gear reduction is called reflection. And the reflected moment of inertia, spring constant, or damping, that is the reflected impedance, is given by the original impedance when you multiply it, or multiplying the original impedance with the ratio, the square of the ratio, number of teeth on the destination shaft divided by number of teeth on the source shaft. So really that is um, sort of the gear ratio. We're squaring the gear ratio and that's how we reflect these impedances. And the way we came up with that was what was shown here where we start off with the free body diagram on our impedances and then we substitute back for the displacements using the gear ratio and we come up with this term here. <coughs> Oftentimes, we can't achieve the gear reduction that we want through one pair of gears, and so we need to employ a gear train. And so this is several consecutive pairs of gears, where the output shaft of one gear pair becomes the input shaft of the other gear pair. So here's where we have three pairs, and we want to find the gear ratio of this entire train. And so we'll do that by just stepping through. Um, so the output displacement is related theta 2 of this the output of this first gear pair is related to the input by n1 over n2 so theta 2 equals n1 over n2 times theta 1 now the output of the second gear pair theta 3 is related to its input by n3 over n4 so theta 3 equals n3 over n4 times theta 2 we substitute in our value that we found here for theta 2 and we get the product of the two gear ratios is the gear ratio from theta 1 to theta 3 so theta 3 is n1 over n2 times n3 over n4 times theta 1. And we have one more gear pair in this example.
So we f see that theta 4 is related to theta 3 by this gear pair, or gear ratio, and substitute in this value we found for theta 3, and we can get the gear ratio of the entire train. So theta 4 related to theta 1. And that gear ratio is just the product of the individual gear ratios. So n1 over n2 times n3 over n4 times n5 over n6. So <coughs> we want to look at an example of reflection through a gear train. And now in this gear train, or this gearing, is different from what we looked at before in that uh, there is some loss associated with this. So these dissipate energy. And we can think of this as just saying that there is a bearing with friction on this shaft. So D1, I call it C1, is just friction on shaft 1 associated with theta 1. And so D2 would be friction associated with uh, motion at theta 2. And this loss here, this 32, would be friction associated with the rotation at theta 3. So how many independent motions are there here? We've got theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. How many independent motions are there? Well, there's just one because this is a rigid shaft, this is a rigid shaft, and this is a rigid shaft. So if you hold this end fixed here, then T, uh, theta 1 can't turn, and neither can theta 3. So any motion at theta 1 uh, results in a motion in theta 2 and theta 3. So there's one independent motion in this example. <coughs> and I redrew this just to sort of demonstrate or just to clarify what's meant by the the damping here on the different gears so here's the same figure just with a little bit different representation so we've got our input torque on theta 1 and then uh, bearing with friction. So theta 1 has this friction associated with it. And then theta 2 has this friction associated with it. So there's theta 2. And then theta 3 has this friction. So this is the same system. And we want to find the transfer function. So what is the displacement here related to the input torque, tau? And so what that looks like is we want to find an equivalent system at theta 1. So tau rotates theta 1 where we have an equivalent moment of inertia, equivalent damping, and equivalent spring constant. So Ke and Ce. So really we're just reflecting these different um, impedances from a source shaft to the destination shaft. So we'll start with the moment of inertia. So the equivalent moment of inertia, we have this moment of inertia, but that is already on this, the destination shaft. So we have simply two. And then the definition of reflectance teeth on the destination shaft divided by teeth on the source shaft squared. So teeth on the destination shaft, that's 4. Teeth on the source shaft is 12. That's for this impedant, or moment of inertia. So 4 over 12 squared. Multiply that by 1. And we also have a moment of inertia here on this third shaft. So for this one, we have two gear pairs, or we can just think of the gear train as a whole. So the gear ratio from here to here, we have 4 over 12 times 4 over 16, and that's squared. And that multi is a multiplier for this impedance times 16. And that ends up being 20 over 9. Do the same thing for the damping, CE. So this damping is already on the s destination shaft. So we have 1 plus, and then we need to reflect C2, 4 over 12 squared times C2, and then reflect C3. And C3 is 32. And all that adds up to 13 ninths. And finally, find the value for this Ke. So Ke 
there is no spring um, on associated with theta 1 or theta 2 so we just have 4 over 12 times 4 over 16 squared times this stiffness times 64 and so the equivalent stiffness is 4 ninths so there are the terms for our equivalent system and now we can just find the transfer function we know that the transfer function is so the equation that we would have would be theta 1 times the sum of the impedances at theta 1 is equal to the sum of the applied torques at theta 1 so theta 1 over tau is just 1 over um, J E S squared plus C E S plus K E. Okay, and then we can substitute in these values for J E C E and K E. So that's how we're going to look at whenever we want to find transfer functions for systems with gearing.